Welcome to Tanya in Real Life. Today we're doing something interesting. We are going to be doing a broad review from the beginning of the Tanya until where we're up to today, because what we're going to do, what we're about to do is learn some strategies for how to be a Benini. In other words, we're getting strategies for how to win the game. So before that, I want to just clarify and bring us, bring it all together in one clear picture. Um, what is the game and what's important and what are we doing here? What's our goal? What's our, what's our objective? What's our desire? What gets in our way? What's on our, what are our assets? Um, and, and all the general awarenesses and the skills that we acquired in chapters one through 11. Let's jump right in. For those of you who are listening, the notes might be very helpful. If you didn't get them, you can check on the chat or you can email to info at energizedliving.org and we'll be happy to send you the notes. So the entire Tanya begins with a question. How should we see ourselves? What label belongs to us? Who am I? Now, right away, the Baal Tanya tells us that if we see ourselves as a Russia, if we see ourselves as somebody who's not a good person, a bad person, we are going to um, feel bad. And we won't be able to serve Hashem with joy. So that's not our ideal way. Any negative labels, sometimes you feel holy that we're calling ourselves bad names. No, joy is the way to go in service of Hashem. Bad labels are not. And sometimes you say, well, I need to know the truth and we're going to call myself bad names and I won't care. But that's chas v'shalom because that leads to not caring, totally switching off our, our emotions. And that's chas v'shalom. So in order to be able to properly identify who we are and understand who we are, so that we give ourselves healthy labels, labels that actually belong to us, we will learn the anatomy of our inner selves and, um, and learn who we are on a deeper level. The next big concept that we are introduced to is the idea of shtenefashes, that we have two selves, two totally different drives, two totally different personality sets. Um, in chapters 10 to 12, we learn that we could define ourselves by how much we allow each of our inner selves to dominate and to show up in our behavior, to be leading ourselves, to be the dominant definition of actually how we're showing up in our lives. The two selves, sometimes we think as two little habits or two little ideas. It's not, it's two totally dr different drives. Each one has full on ca capacity for emotions and intellects. And each one is a mindset. It is driven in a completely different direction. Um, in chapter one, we're introduced to the first one. It's the animal self, the Nefesh Bahamas. In chapter two, we're introduced to the second soul, the Nefesh Kiss. And the reason why the second one, the Nefesh Kiss, even though it's so much more precious and it's our deeper, truer self, it's called the second is because we experience it second. Our natural default setting is our... Um, animal self, that's our human di dimension. That's like if we, if we don't think and we're not switching ourselves on, that's how we behave. That's our natural dominant self. And also because ultimately the goal of our lives is to get our animal self to come on board, to transform our human nature into one that is aligned with our neshama, with our um, godly self. So at Sadiq, is so the Baal Tanya doesn't answer the question of who am I and how should I see myself? What label actually belongs to me? Doesn't answer this question until chapters 10 and 11 and 12. And here's where we get those definitions, okay? That Sadiq is somebody who is entirely aligned with Hashem. If it's not by Hashem, with Hashem, for Hashem, it's not on my radar. A tzaddik's behavior is dominated exclusively by the Nevashali kiss. And on the inside of the tzaddik, within his heart and mind, the Nevesha Bahamas is either totally asleep or it's already transformed. It's brought on board to become part. It's on the team of the Nevashali kiss. It became a part of the Nevashali kiss. The Russia is the opposite. The Russia is, says, I am so obsessed with my ego, I can't get over myself. If it's not by myself, with myself, for myself, I don't care about it. Anything beyond myself is not relevant. A Russia's behavior is dominated by the Nefesh Bahamas because that by myself, with myself, for myself is the mindset and the attitude of the Nefesh Bahamas. Um, and so the Russia's behavior is dominated by the Nefesh Bahamas. 
and within his mind and heart, where's the Nefesh kiss? Either it's campaigning, come on, wake up, there's another reality, there's another world, there's God beyond you, don't get so caught up. You're not, the, you're not your own existence. You're actually, there's a God in this world and you're not here by yourself, with yourself, for yourself. You're here by Hashem, with Hashem, for Hashem. Nefesh kiss is campaigning or, um, and, 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 and the person actually can hear it, doesn't, not enough to change, but enough to at least uh, hear it and experience some for, form of awareness of it, or we say Jewish guilt. Um, and, or the or the Nevesha Bahamas or the Nevesha Kiss is just exhausted and tired and so many layers of co- covering it up and it has very little practical impact on the person. And then we meet the Bainani, which is what we all want to aspire to be. The Nefesh Bainani is someone who says, My Nevesha Bahamas, that part of me that's so attached to my emotions, my natural instinctive emotions, my human limitations, my weaknesses, all that, that part of me is active and alert, but I am determined to let my nefesh kiss, my neshama, my godliness, my beautiful unstoppable light show up and shine forth in every behavior, every time, in every situation. That's the modus operandi of a benini. That's the commitment, the call to action, the, the mission statement of the benini. And that's really something that we could all aspire to, and we're going to find out exactly how. The Bainini's dom- behavior is totally dominant, dominated by the Nevesh kiss, even though within his mind and heart, within her mind and heart, there's a raging, fierce battle for control of the behaviors. In chapter nine, we learn that in any given moment, in every situation, only our hearts and minds are dominated by one of these two drives. We can have a tzaddik moment, we can have a Russia moment, we can have a Benini moment. We are who we are. I have this possibility and that possibility. We define ourselves in every moment by our behavior. Okay, number three, our Nefesh Bahamas. What's our Nefesh Bahamas? It's our animal self. We learned that it's derived from klipa. Klipa means a shell of concealment. Sometimes we think of klipa as long, green, scary, ferocious nails. Klipa is a shell of concealment. Klipa is the energy that conceals Hashem's presence, Hashem's truth, Hashem's reality. And of course, it also conceals our truth, our alignment, our bond, our oneness with Hashem. The Nefesh Bahamas is rooted in the primary elements of creation, the Eish, Ruach, Maim, Afar, fire, wind, water, and earth. And this is the root of all our instincts and inborn tendencies that distract us from Hashem. And we've talked about this at length, that there is no judgment or shame in having unhealthy or destructive impulses. Hashem made us this way. Hashem wired us this way. And why did Hashem do it? So that we'll have opportunities to choose, so that we'll have opportunities to let his truth make a difference and that that will come, that truth will come from a deep place and a commitment inside of us. We could only have a choice if there's an otherness from which we can choose. Another um, important thing to note about this is that our spiritual makeup includes inborn tendencies towards all kinds of behaviors and emotional states, including depression, anxiety, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, emotional neediness, the possibility to be impacted by trauma, toxicity, the, the possibility to to be emotional impacted by all kinds of emotional, physical, psychological abuse. And so even when we need medication to manage these tendencies because they're too intense and we really feel incapable of handling them or getting a grip on our life because these are um, really getting in the way of our functioning, even when, when somebody needs medication, there's no shame in that. But we always, always, always need spiritual tools because there's always two elements in emotional illness. There's the biological part, and then there's the external la- layer that is controllable that we need to actually do something about, and we need spiritual tools for that. Um, that's Ch- Tanya chapter one. Then we talk about the Nefesh kiss, which we meet in 
um, chapter two. It's an actual part of Hashem derived from Hashem himself, driven to pursue Torah and mitzvah since its mindset is, I am here in this world by Hashem, with Hashem and for Hashem. Now, how much is an actual part of Hashem worth? How much, how much does it cost? What's it worth emotionally in emotional wealth? What's a part of Hashem worth in physical wealth? What difference does Hashem's presence actually make in real time in, in different situations that we face? So Hashem's, Hashem is limitless. Hashem is infinite. His preciousness is infinite. His value cannot be measured. There's no beginning. There's no end. There's nothing that we could compare it to. But the more we value Hashem, remember we talked about truth versus our experience of the truth. The truth is always there, but how much we experience it depends on us. So Hashem's truth is absolute. His value is infinite, immeasurable, unstoppable. But how much we actually value it is, depends on our awareness. And how much we experience it depends on how much we value it. So that's Tanya chapter, that's what we learn about in Ta Tanya chapter, chapter two. And another point that's interesting to mention is that our deepest self, our neshama, because we have this at the core of our self and elsewhere in Hasidus, it talks about how, um, you know, every part of our animal self, we learned this in Tanya chapter, I forgot which chapter offhand, but Zelu Umazer, right? Hashem made everything parallel. But there is one part of our nefesh alikis, our neshama, that has no parallel dimension in the um, nefesh abahamis, and that is the essence of the Jewish soul. It's inextinguishable, it's unstoppable, it's pure, nothing can touch it. No sin can get in its way, no mitzvah can increase its value, there's nothing about it. And by the way, this is what Esther touched um, in her in 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 um, activating the miracle of Purim, we we when we talk about Adela Yada to the point of not knowing, that's the that's the part that we want to try to access. It's the deepest part of our relationship with Hashem that is just beyond knowing. It's unknowable. Adela Yada. It's unknowable. That's the awakening that we want to aim for on Purim. And we'll talk about this more in Mirza Hashem on Monday night in our learning about joy as it connects to Purim, but that's just, I'm gonna mention it because we are in Adar. So because our deepest self is so connected with Hashem, it's, it's one with Hashem, that's why when we deny Hashem's presence, we cannot be in absolute harmony with our self. When our behaviors are aligned with Hashem's reality, we experience a deep inner peace, an inner alignment and a sense of peace and we when we go when we don't when we deny who we really are that in itself leads to emotional chaos and unhealthiness okay then we learned another word another vocabulary word here is that eser nefesh, 10 capabilities 10 capacities of the soul they are three intellectual capacities and seven emotional capacities each self has its own eser kreches nefesh. Each, each self has a different kind of intellect and a different kind of emotion, and they operate completely differently from each other. The neshama's modus operandi, the neshama's way of operating or the operating system, and it's important to know it so that we can work it, right? We talked about if we know how to work, how the neshama works, we can work that to help ourselves. So the neshama... Um, the relationship between emotions and intellect and behavior within our neshama is that we do not experience any emotions automatically. The only way to experience emotions in relationship to Hashem or to our godliness is when we consciously turn it on. We turn on those emotions. How do we turn on the emotions? By thinking about Hashem consciously. That's the only way to generate emotions. Um, we talked about da'as being lasha in his kashras with his chabras. Da'as means to create union and attachment, a personal connection. The yiska machshafta b'chayzek, we should fixate our thoughts, turn the spotlight of our mind towards thoughts about Hashem. This is our most powerful tool that we have in accessing our inner wealth. 
because by thinking about Hashem, we develop awareness, and by develop awareness, we develop accessibility um, and consciousness, and with that, we have that inner wealth at our fingertips. We're able to benefit from it in a practical way. We can get courage, dignity, worthiness, compassion, tolerance, acceptance, everything that we need, we have it in ourselves. But in order to have access to that, we have to think about Hashem and personalize those ideas. Okay, that's the Eser Krech Eser Nefesh as it relates to the Neshama. Now let's talk about the Eser Krech Eser Nefesh as it relates to our Nefesh Abahamas, our human dimension. And I call Nefesh Abahamas our human dimension because it's our default setting. Anytime we are not consciously thinking about Hashem or directing our intentions towards Hashem, we are in Nefesh Abahamas mode. That's our human operating system as well. So in our human self, in our Nefesh Bahamas, we experience our emotions automatically. We do not have to consciously generate emotions. But the automaticity, that system, is hardwired. It's established by what we value, by our value system. Hamidais lefi erech hasechel. Our emotions are directly generated by our intellect, specifically by what we value. We can change our emotions by what we value. By the way, I quoted the first beginning of the sentence, our emotions are according to our intellect. But the next line in Tanya, the Baal Tanya says that a undeveloped, a young, a immature intellect values small things. So the Baal Tanya is not just talking about beliefs in general. He's talking about our value system. So we can change our emotions by changing what we value. Maybe not in the moment. It takes work. It takes focus, it takes perspective, but by inviting the gift of perspective, we can actually change our emotions. Again, sometimes it's something that we can do in a moment, and sometimes it takes a lot more time. Over time, when we do this over a long period of time, consistently, we do change ourselves on a deeper level. Our Nefesh Abahamas always wants comfort. That's all it wants. Comfort, 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 comfort. If it's pleasurable, it's good. If it's comfortable, it's good. If it's uncomfortable, it's dangerous. Stay away. When we are emotionally immature, our definition of comfort is short-term comfort. It's short-term pleasure, immediate gratification, instant gratification. That's what we see as comfortable. But as we grow into maturity, even our Nefesh Bahamas, I'm not talking about emo- spiritual maturity. I'm talking about you know, physical our human self matures, we appreciate the comfort of truth and meaning. And this is the language that we can use to get our Nefesh Bahamas on board with our Nishama, because we can tell our Nefesh Bahamas, look here, you wanna be comfortable? You know, it's that's not gonna happen just from physical pleasures. You actually need to be aligned with truth and the ultimate truth is Hashem. So that's how we get our animal self on board. Okay, the next number six is Levushe Hanefesh, the garments of the soul, thought, speech, thought, speech, and action. And really, every single behavior that we do, all our behaviors are clothing of each of our nefashas. They are our nefesh, the, the mediums of expression for our deeper self. Clo- our, our behavior is an expression of our inner personality, of our inner drive, of our inner self. And that's the same, that's true for both, again, the nefesh, both souls and both sets of personalities, okay? Behavior expresses it. Thought is an action. And then we talked about how um, we include thought, conscious thought as one of the behaviors, right? Because thought is an action that we do in our minds. We reflect, we ruminate, we focus our attention, we visualize, we ponder, we analyze, we consider, We deliberate, we meditate, we reason. All these are different types of actions that we do in our minds. We remember, um, we, okay. Um, The Baal Tanya makes a firm distinction between our inner strengths, our kreches hanefesh that we said before, and our outer expressions, our behavior. And this is so important to keep in mind because this distinction between our inner self and our outer self is so, 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 so important because when we want to invite change in our life, the place to begin is with our outer self. Our inner self eventually will be impacted as well. But when we determine, when we set out to change our inner self without 
focusing on our behaviors, we get lost, we get frustrated, we get the, we, we easily fall into this fear because it's not possible. Our inner self is, we're born. Our inner st strengths, our personality traits are inherent. If I have a tendency towards anxiety, I can't fight it. If I have a tendency towards depression or laziness, I can't fight that tendency. I'm born with this strength. I'm born with this tendency, with this personality. It's not gonna change from here to, from today over. It's not gonna change by willing it to change. They will only change over a long period of time with consistent effort on managing my behavior. That's where we wanna, um, that's where we wanna invest our effort because that is where behaviors are easily changeable. Just like clothing is not who we are, our behavior is not who we are. So we should not label ourselves according to our behavior. Within each moment, we could choose our behaviors. I could, you know, people who say, I can never be organized. Maybe, but can you do, can you, can you do this moment in an organized way? Nobody will say, nobody will say they can't. Can you do this millisecond with, can you, can you for, 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 for five seconds, could you try to stay focused on the positive instead of the negative? For five seconds, could you divert your attention onto what's working well instead of what's working not well? For five seconds, could you, you know, divert your attention away from that anxiety, away from what feels so, so, so um, overwhelming into what you can do this second? Five seconds we could do. And that's our biggest tool over here because that's the Baal Tanya's way of teaching us that that's that's our path forward that's don't don't worry about changing your inner self don't worry about becoming a different kind of person focus your attention on on showing up this moment the way you want to so though our behavior is not who we are our behavior this is another level okay that was just a reflection of my part this is going back to the Baal Tanya's actual text Though our behavior is not who we are, our behavior can take us higher or lower than ourselves. Our neshama, on its way into the world, experiences a state of concealment from Hashem. It develops a sense of self, a consciousness that is, in by, by, by the fact that it has a consciousness of self, it's already outside of Hashem's presence because within Hashem's presence, there is no other. There is only Hashem. So our neshama on its way into our system develops a sense of self. A mitzvah elevates us past all that stuff, past our human consciousness and past even our, uh, beyond even our neshama's consciousness to a place of revealed oneness with Hashem. By contrast, that's when we do a mitzvah by, or learn Torah. By contrast, when we act on our nefesh Bahamas, when we act with denying or rejecting or just not being aware of Hashem's truth, in that moment, we draw down that energy to, right, our, our nefesh Bahamas has the potential to conceal Hashem. But when we, and that, in that sense, it's called klipa because it has the potential to conceal Hashem's presence. It, 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 it could, but when we do an action, in which we are act actually not recognizing Hashem's presence, we bring that down lower from potential to conceal Hashem to actually concealing Hashem's presence to a place of where now it's impossible in that space to demonstrate Hashem's truth, Hashem's reality, Hashem's um, MS. And the only way to elevate that is through tshuva. Emotions on their own, this is another point that connects with this idea. Um, emotions on our own do not give us access to a dynamic, active relationship with Hashem. The doorway to a relationship with Hashem because emotions are only within our own hearts and minds. If we wanna get past ourselves, we need to and bond actively with Hashem on, and experience that bond, it's only through a mitzvah. The doorway to a relationship with Hashem is by Hashem's design. That's the only way that the infinite God, the infinite creator could be one with finite man, with a finite human being. So when we do a mitzvah, we're embracing Hashem's light and Hashem's light completely embraces us from head to toe. 
Learning Torah takes that a step further. In addition to it being a mitzvah, it's something else because we are actually ingesting Hashem himself. When a person learns, you're wrapping your mind around the idea and the idea is wrapping itself around you. And with most ideas, they're just ideas. We don't actually have, like if we're studying geometry, the numbers are in our mind, not the physical numbers, but the idea, the abstract representation of the numbers. If I'm studying astronomy, I don't have the moon in my head. I don't have the stars in my head. I have an image of the stars. But by contrast, when we study Taira, it's not just the words that are in our head. Hashem himself is in our head. And in that sense, and, and the Baal Tanya says, there is no other oneness in this world that could compare to the oneness that we achieve with God, with Hashem, with our creator, when we are engaged in Torah study. Learning Torah is an act that directly nourishes and feeds and strengthens our neshama. Okay, now let's talk about the other side, Sitra Achra, our inner otherness and what otherness actually is. You know, people think of Sitra Achra again as evil, monstrous, criminal, murderous. It is the true definition of Sitra Achra means the other side. It's the other side of Kedusha. Anything that does not clearly demonstrate and express Hashem's truth, anything that's not transparent to Hashem's reality is the other side, is Sitra Achra. And because we're using the word Kedusha, let's translate the word Kedusha. Kedusha is a space where Hashem's presence or a reality, where it's a moment in time or space or in a person where Hashem's presence is manifest. Hashem's presence is active and alert or fully charged. Um, and where does this happen? Where is their Kedusha? It's not where we shuckle and sway harder. It's not where there's a more beautiful esrig or a fancier mishloach manis or a bigger cup of wine. It's none of that. Kedusha is, or maybe not necessarily that those are bad things, but that's not the essence of Kedusha. The essence of Kedusha is anything, any person or any space where Hashem's presence is clearly demonstrated and revealed. The opposite of Bittal, that's Bittal. Bittal equals Kedusha. Bittal, Kedusha equals Bittal, the same thing, okay? Um, Bittal is anything or any space or when, or for us, it's a behavior, a mindset. We are being Bittal when we are fully aware of our dependency on nobody but Hashem. That's when we are in Bittal. We are in a state of Bittal when we are fully aware that we are reflections of God's light in this world, of Hashem's light. We are carriers of Hashem's light in this world. That's Bittal. The opposite of Bittal, which is the root of all our otherness, all our, men, all our emotional illness, is when we see ourselves as if we are Dover, Nifrat, Bifnei, Atzmai, separate self-sufficient entities on our own, alone in this world, by myself, with myself, for myself. And my reflection on this is that bito is a muscle we can strengthen with exercise, just like any other physical muscle. Bito is a muscle we can strengthen with exercise. How do we strengthen our bito? By coming back to it, by embracing it, by holding on to it, by looking at ourselves and the world through that lens of through that transparent lens of Hashem is real, Hashem is actual, Hashem is practical, and He is the supreme power and the supreme value and my identity and my only life force. Okay, my everything. So Bittal is a muscle we can strengthen through exercise. How do we exercise it? Through looking at ourselves and the world around us through the lens of that truth. So when we find ourselves in any state of otherness, any misery, resentment, helplessness, self-pity, toxicity, emotional overwhelm, laziness, or just plain down in the dumpness, that's not a word, the common denominator in all of this is that we are feeling ourself as an end in itself. We're feeling ourself and we're stuck in ourself and we can't get out of that self. 
So the key to start moving out of any of that energy is practicing bittel. Think about Hashem's presence, invite Hashem into that picture. And with that, we are no longer a self as an end in ourself. We're a self with all our weaknesses and with all our challenges and all our emotional stuff and our baggage and our trauma and our toxicity and the people and the this and the that, all that stuff, we're seeing it in perspective of Hashem's truth and, and our dependency on Hashem and his empowerment of us and his taking charge of all of us and his direction of all of it. And with that perspective, we're not a self. Just by inviting Hashem into that picture, by practicing bittel as a muscle, as an exercise, just by inviting Hashem into the picture with the awareness that we have about Hashem, that we've been learning about Hashem, we're already not a self as an end in ourselves. We see we are created by Hashem. We're with Hashem. We're powered by Hashem. We're here for Hashem. And in that mode, we can just say, okay, so what difference is Hashem going to make? What perspective am I now going to have? What shift am I going to have in my perspective now that Hashem walked into my story? Now that Hashem walked into my room, into my reality, into this very moment in time, into this space in my heart, that's so dark. He walked in. Okay, now what's going to happen? When we do that, when we allow Hashem to make that difference, that is an exercise of Bittal. Another thought about Bittal is that Bittal represents reality as it is. Bittal is the truth because that's the truth of our reality. Hashem is true and Bittal is truth. We are designed, defined, and powered by Hashem. That is our truth. Now, self-definition is an essential need. Identity and having value. These are essential human needs. So if our human self does not accept our state of Bittal, if our human self doesn't accept the truth of our bittel, of our transparency to Hashem, of our utter dependency and definition by Hashem, what happens is subconsciously we create an ego. And I think all of us have egos and we have moments in which we are controlled by our ego and moments in which we are controlled by bittel because we're not perfect, right? We're trying to be Bainanim. A Bainani is somebody who, who really lets go of their ego, but we're trying to be Bainani. We have Bainani moments, right? So we have ego moments and Bittal moments. All of us have, bit, have ego. Our ego is our imagined version of ourself, our desired version of ourself. What we want, what we would like to think about ourselves or what we'd like other people to think of us. It's as big as our unawareness. How big is our ego? How fragile is it? Okay, it's as, it's as fragile as it's big and our ego is going to always be directly proportionate. It's always gonna be as big as our lack of Bittal. Bittal and ego are opposites. Bittal is awareness of dependency on Hashem, self-definition by Hashem, with Hashem, for Hashem. Ego is the absence of Bittal, ego is the creation of a whole self in the void of where I don't have Bittal. Now I need a creative version of myself, by myself, with myself, for myself. So our ego is as big as our unawareness of our true identity and our Bittal. And it's entirely imagined. So the bigger the ego, the more fragile it is. And think about a balloon that pops. The more, the bigger it is, the more easily it is, the more easy it is for it to pop. And the more hurt we feel when it pops. Okay, thoughts of anxiety. Here's one more thought about Bittal. Thoughts of anxiety, depression, laziness, tuning out of the world, distracting ourselves, escaping reality, whatever, you know, angry thoughts, jealous thoughts, manipulative thought, whatever it is, all of these thoughts are just thoughts. They can pass through our minds just like trains pass through the train station. We do not have to jump onto every thought. They're not destructive. They don't do anything to us. Thoughts are just thoughts. And remember what we said before about we don't control the nature, the quality of our thoughts. 
That's not within our immediate sphere of influence. We never have to be angry at a thought for popping into our mind. We never have to feel shame about the fact that this kind of thought popped into my mind. That's not, that's, that's beyond our control. Hashem decides which trains come into the train station or which thoughts come into our mind. Thoughts only become destructive when we relate to them as if they are facts. When we get stuck in them, when we feel compelled to ride on them and we can't let go of them. So, so that's, um, why did I connect it here? Is because Bittel <laughs> protects us from all of this. Bittel means that not every thought that comes into my mind belongs to me. I am, my mind actually doesn't belong to me. I belong to Hashem. I, Hashem doesn't want me to go on that destructive train, right? But if I don't have Bittel and I think, I am here by myself, with myself, for myself, then if I think it, then it must be true. And I got to ride on that train because it's in my head. Of course I have to ride on it. It's my head. And we can't ever challenge ourselves. So bit, the ego gets in our way of challenging ourselves, of growing, of, of letting go of beliefs that are destroying ourselves when they're not even true. Okay, Ir Kitana, this we learned in Perak Tess. Our body is like a small city, Irkatana, a small city. Each of our two selves are in a constant state of battle for control to be our king, the king of who we are, the king of our identity, the king of our mind, our heart, and our behavior. Okay, now we're going to do something really um, cool. I think it's cool. It was fun to write this and to think about it. We're going to bring all of the above. That was, I, I kind of did that by theme, by dictionary, you know, by, by, by concepts. What we just laid out was all the different players in the field. You know, if you're feeling um, inner conflict, now this gives us, we have the language to describe our inner conflict. Well, right now what I'm experiencing is my Nevesha Bahamas is pulling me here. And it's really giving me this feeling of X, Y, or Z. Meanwhile, my ego, is 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 totally hijacking my brain <laughs> and it's getting me to feel like da 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 if now i want to look at myself let me what if i look at these facts and this situation through the lens of bittel what if i what if i um you know what if i invite hashem into the picture you know we also have this idea of the language by which we can separate our struggles from our behaviors, our unchangeable reality, from our changeable reality. You know, we could stop fighting with our depressing thoughts. I don't have to control that. It's not my business. It's only my kachas and nefesh. That is how Hashem wired me. What I could control is my levusha and nefesh. It's like if you, you know, you, you can't lose weight from one second to the next. You can't change your body. This is what this is who you are. You're gonna, no matter how much you beat yourself up, you can't beat yourself into being skinnier. You can't blow yourself up into being heavier. You just can't do that. But you could change what you wear in a second. You could change the color of your dress. You could change your dress. You could change your behavior in a second. And long term, over a period of time, yes, if you exercise, you know, you can change the health and the nature of your body, but this is not an instant thing. If you folk, if you wake up in the morning and you hate your hate the way you look, don't start beating up your face. That's just gonna make you look worse. Put on a little makeup. You know, if you hate the way, go buy yourself a new dress, you know, where that makes that you feel pretty in. Don't start beating yourself up. It doesn't mean that you're never gonna, you get it? That's so the, the, the distinction between Levushe and Nefesh and the Kirchis and Nefesh. We have the language now that we can use to have a conversation with ourselves or with fellow Tanya students, people who study Tanya, all of us. We have the language in which we could have a conversation about our struggles, about our goals, about what we aspire to, about how we see ourselves. Okay, we have, we have all that language and I would love to, we're gonna open up to questions in just a minute. Now what I wanna do is just run through the chapters in order of the chapters and see, 
and I'm going to choose one idea, one message of the chapter, one skill or one awareness that we gain from each chapter that all lead up to empowerment for dealing with the struggles in our lives. Okay, so chapter one is number one, change how you see yourself. You're not your weakness. You're not your challenge. You're not your limitation. Let go of those toxic labels. Enough. Send them flying. They don't belong to you. Anything that pulls you down, all that otherness within you, it's part of your nature. Okay, you have the tendency to take on ugly, moldy, dirty labels from your from that you that you found on the floor 20 years ago. <laughs> or someone passed you. You have on you have the tendency to take on labels that ugly labels that people give you that situations give you it's part of your nature but don't be afraid of it the second you're aware of it you can let it go it's there to help you fulfill your life the only reason why hashem allows us to take on those labels is so that we should consciously choose to let go of it it's coming at us to strengthen us not to weaken us it doesn't belong to us okay chapter two you are hashem's beloved child we're that label with awareness, with strength, with dignity. Wear it and let it carry you as you carry it. You have limitless spiritual wealth. The more you become aware of Hashem's awesomeness, the more you will feel awesome wealth inside of you. The more emotional strength, dignity, and courage, resilience, worthiness, respectability, you will be empowered to draw from within your own self. We use the visual of a billionaire. Okay. In chapter two, we learn that we are a billionaire. Okay. So go check out your bank account. Wake up. You're a billionaire. Chapter three, invest time thinking about Hashem's awesomeness and make those ideas personal. Without this, you will gain nothing from your inner wealth. Nothing. Without consciously thinking about Hashem, your inner wealth is like having a a billionaire having a billion dollars in the bank and he lives in a hovel, a, 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 a shack with leaky roofs and bread, barely crummy, moldy bread. That is, if you don't spend time thinking about Hashem, we will be emotionally and spiritually poor. We will feel disconnected, bored and empty. And in that emptiness, we will be swept up by whatever other people define us with, whatever reality defines us with, whatever natural tendencies we have. If I have a tendency to be depressed and I don't do any of the work that we're talking about, I will be sucked up into my depression. I will never be able to escape it unless I do this work of having access to my emotional inner wealth, which comes only from investing time thinking about Hashem. So, Thinking about Hashem is making that decision that we will personally benefit from the immense wealth that Hashem gives us. It's deciding how we will benefit from it. I'm going to learn about Hashem. I'm going to think about Hashem and I will therefore, therefore benefit from this wealth. Chapter four, do mitzvahs. Very simple. Do mitzvahs because when you do a mitzvah, you're making your neshama into your dominant leading self. Every mitzvah that you do gives your neshama expression in your consciousness. Mitzvahs activate your bond with Hashem so that it's not just a subconscious truth, but an active experienced reality. And in the visual about the billionaire, it's like make your inner wealth more accessible to you. Get a bank card, swipe it, use it, buy something with it. Don't let it just sit in the bank. Buy a beautiful house, make yourself comfortable. Chapter five, learn Tyra. Learning Tyra gives strength and increasing energy to your neshama. Nothing else in the world feeds our soul, our godly soul, our, our, our spiritual energy, our spiritual wealth, like our neshama. So increase your wealth with good investments. That's an individual, like, you know, a billionaire always wants to make more money. You want to make more money? Invest wisely, right? So learning Tyra increases our spiritual wealth. Chapter six, your emotions are generated by your values. Become aware of what you value. Become aware. Whenever you're, become aware. What do I value? What's important to me? What made me feel so excited about this compliment? What made me so hurt? What am I valuing here? Recognize that you can change your emotions by changing what you value. 
and become willing to choose the value of truth over the value of comfort because that's growing up. We grow up emotionally, we become emotionally mature when we are willing to let go of our marriage to the comfort of pleasure and we embrace the comfort of truth. Okay, also in this chapter, in every moment, this is where we learned this, we are either in the mindset of Nefesh Elikis or Nefesh Bahamas. We're either aligned with Hashem's awesomeness or we are in otherness. There is nothing in between. There's no in between. In every moment of time, you're either part of the solution called Geula or you're part of the problem called Gullus. Nothing in between. In every moment, there's either one of the two selves. It's your Nefesh Elikis or your Nefesh Bahamas. You're God-focused, God conscious or not. Simple as that. Okay. Either our either we're in ego or we're in bitl. Our bitl nefesh kiss says, I am here by Hashem with Hashem for Hashem. Ego says, I am here by myself with myself for myself. Emotional illness, like we said before, has a biological component. It's an inherent component that might often be and it's certainly beyond our immediate reach. It might be, you know, over long term, it could change, but it's beyond our immediate reach. It's part of how Hashem created us. But emotional illness has an external layer that we could heal only with spiritual tools. The entire external, because we're spiritual beings, we're godly people. So we need Hashem in our life. We, we just need, that's how, that's our healing force. That is, Hashem is our healer. His truth is the healing force in our lives. So the entire external layer of emotional illness is our detachment from our never shall we kiss, from our bitzel mindset and the illusion that we are limited to our humanness and our own version of our identity. Chapter seven, I know we're speeding, but we all, you know, did... If you want, if you feel like, oh my goodness, I don't remember that at all, go back to the chapter um, recording and listen to that in greater detail, okay? Chapter seven, what matters more than anything else in the entire universe is your choice right here, right now, in this moment of time. So choose to align with Bittel. What happens when this moment, forget about anything else, it's so important what you do right now. Why? Because this moment, you choose to align with Bittel. You choose to align to show up in good health just for this moment. With that choice, you elevate yourself and you elevate your surroundings. You elevate everything that you're doing to a state of Kedusha, like a Oila and a Karban, to a state of Hashem's revealed presence. And by the way, Geula is a time, the ultimate redemption is a time when the world will be filled with Hashem's presence revealed, right? That is what Geula, that's the definition of Geula. So every moment in which we show up in a state of Bittal, with a Bittal mindset, in a healthy, with our healthy self, in good health, in a state of Bittal, right? With awareness of Hashem, with that, we are experiencing a personal taste of Geula in our own lives. And we're inviting Geula into the entire world because we're all inter dependent. And in the moment of choice, in, in the same moment, if we get stuck in ego and pull down that energy and ourselves, we, we impact ourselves. We, we bring ourselves into greater conceal, concealment and we bring more gullus into the world. So what matters more than anything else is our choices, each of our choices right now. And yes, our Yetzirah will use that against us. And when we made an unhealthy choice, an unproductive choice, a choice of ego rather than bittel, our ego will hate us for it, but our neshama knows that that is just a tactic of the Yetzirah to pull, pull us even further, to get us more stuck in the mud, okay? Anything that gets you distracted from showing up this moment with your neshama shining forth, with your bittel mindset, by Hashem, with Hashem, for Hashem, anything that gets in your way is your ego, your, uh, your Yetzirah, your animal self, your, and, and, and part of it, again, is not controllable, but all of it, all of it is here so that this moment we can show up with 
that when we when we make that choice to do one moment in alignment with Hashem's truth, that choice is fulfilling the purpose of creation and bringing ourselves into a state of geula for ourselves and the whole world. Chapter eight, what, what goes down will eventually come up. When we do tshuva, we return the energy that was brought down and we elevate it to a state of Hashem's revealed presence. Nothing in this world gets stuck forever. There's no Neverland. Okay, I don't know what Neverland is, but you know what I mean? There's no none of that nothingness, forever nothingness. It always, whatever goes down, eventually returns up to a state of elevated, revealed Hashem, Hashem's revealed presence. Chapter nine, we learned that our two selves are in a constant state of battle for absolute exclusive control of our mind and heart. So we never want to minimize the importance of our behavior in this moment. There's no such thing. My mother used to say, Zed is no just. You know, we used to say a just in this. She'd say, there's no just. What does it mean there's no just? There's no such thing as saying just this and I'm done. Okay. Every behavior strengthens the dominance of either our neshama or our nefesh Bahamas. There's no in between. Every behavior strengthens the dominance, the leadership, the control of either our neshama or our ego. And with that dominance comes stronger influence. With that dominance, what the dominance looks like means I will identify with that more. I will get more stuck in it. We can never liberate ourselves from anxiety by entertaining anxious thoughts. We never liberate ourselves from obsessive compulsive behavior by checking the fire one more time or by washing our hands one more time. We never feed our unhealthiness by acting on it. Never. It never works that way. Every time we feed and act, we, be, we act on something, we reinforce that action in our, we are wiring our brains towards that. And the same way that applies for unhealthy behaviors, it, be, it, be, it applies for healthy behaviors. The first time you say maida'ani, it might be you have to push yourself to focus your attention for five seconds, you know, but with practice, you'll be able to focus your attentions for 10 seconds and then for 12 seconds. Okay. Another thing that's important to, that we take from this idea that there's a constant state of battle is that we can expect to feel challenged by overwhelming intense emotions. In fact, if you don't have any internal conflict, it's probably because you gave up the fight. You gave up the fight. You, you stopped, you, you surrendered. You're done, you're finished. You're, you, there's something dead about that. There's nothing more silent than the silence of a graveyard. It's not, the silence of a graveyard is not necessarily peaceful, right? We, 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 the silence of a graveyard means we're, there, there's a certain sense of peace, you know, that, that the life has trans, transitioned into a different world. But when we talk about inner conflict, you know, when we want, a lot of people have a goal in their hearts that they want to achieve a state of inner peace. Like, you know, you want to live like this, you know, you're never going to go up and down. I want to be totally serene forever. It's not, that's going to happen in the graveyard in Mirza Shem. <laughs> that's going to happen when Mashiach comes. As long as we're alive, we will have inner conflict. And that's healthy. That means we're alive. And the fact that we experience intense emotions and we experience intense, an intense down means that we have intense energy to get up. And Hashem wants us to hold that intense energy with reverence with awareness, with strength, and to use that energy to overcome that low. So that's the purpose of why Hashem created us, the purpose of what Hashem wants of us. It's, 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 it's so we never have to feel upset at ourselves. We don't have to hate ourselves for having overwhelming, intense emotions. Don't be afraid of your emotions. Don't be afraid of the fear. Don't be anxious about the anxiety. It's not, it's there for a purpose. It's your friend. It's your support. It's part of how you're going to grow. You can't grow without it. The challenge is Hashem's design. It's there for us to gain deeper awareness of 
a, a deeper awareness and stronger alignment with Hashem's truth, with Hashem's reality. It's an opportunity to strengthen, to choose our never shall kiss mindset, to choose neshama over ego with greater strength. And it's opportunity to let our neshama shine forth by choice, not by default. And this choice is the purpose of creation. Every time we let our never shall kiss win the battle, we experience a taste of geula on a personal level, and we bring Mashiach closer for the entire universe. Chapter 10, we learn about the tzaddik. Keep investing energy in thinking about Hashem. This is our most important tool. Never stop investing energy. Even when you feel like you arrived, like you grew spiritually, every day there's a new day, and it's a new opportunity and a new necessity to think about Hashem and develop emotional charge around Hashem's awesomeness and to work on developing pleasure and delight in our connection with Hashem. Chapter 11, it tells us about a Russia. And from this, we learn that we cannot afford to take a break from our work to stay aligned with Hashem's reality. We can't take a break. There's no such thing as I'm going on vacation, <laughs> okay? Default setting. We just can't afford it. Our sanity depends on our awareness. You could go on vacation and have a great time and take in the beautiful scenes of nature that Hashem created. So I'm not talking about not going on physical vacation. What I'm talking about is we cannot afford to take a break from the awareness, from holding on to that awareness with consciousness, with effort, with, with care, with carefulness, with thoughtfulness because lack of awareness is literally like a progressive emotional disease. It never gets better by itself, okay? We can't just, you know, problems that you ignore are like teeth, they go away, uh -huh. <laughs> right? Um, yeah, but oh, lack of awareness of Hashem is like a progressive disease. So I hate to end off on that note, but we're not gonna end off on this note because now we have some, we have, it's exactly 1.30, um, but we have some, well, let's take a couple of minutes for questions, um, thoughts. Baal Tanya says that there's always either the Nefesh Bahamas or the Nefesh Kiss is in charge. There's always a combination of their presence, but only one is in charge. So if I'm, if I'm washing my dishes and I want to be, and I want to put my Nefesh Kiss in charge, all I have to do is just keep Hashem in the picture of the dishes. You know what I mean? It's, 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 um, it's effort. It takes focus of our attention because our mind, we forget about Hashem, you know? But um, we, we dip in and out of consciousness, of awareness of Hashem's presence. But we can keep coming back to it. And that's part of Hashem's, um, of Hashem's design. And by just being aware, every act, you know, in, if you look around the world, Klipas Naiga, the Baal Tanya says, is everywhere. Most of the world is, is, is klipas nega. What is klipas nega? It's, it conceals Hashem, but it's a light layer of concealment. You just have to rip, you can easily just peel it off. It's like a tomato peel. You know what I mean? You just have to like, or, or a banana peel. You just like, you easily just rip it off and it's, and it's right there. So all our neutral behaviors are, go into that category, but they don't stay. Once we're using it, once we're doing it, it doesn't stay neutral. It's either going to go up or it's going to go down. And we are the ones who make that happen by either being conscious of Hashem or not. Wow. That is so beautiful. I want to just say this over for the recording. Lack of awareness and awareness can be compared to being in the light or being on the dark. And all of these tools that we're learning in the Tanya are really about how to turn on the switch, how to turn on that light so that we could so that we can get the benefits of that light. Wow, thank you. So thank you very much. And next week, Upgrade to Awesome. We're not having any daytime. I apologize for everybody who's not available to come at night. I know, I know that it's hard, but just because the, the week is so much shorter um, and I have other things happening after perm. So we're gonna do Joy on Monday night, nine o'clock. If you can join us, that would be really, really nice. Um, and exciting. We're also going to talk, of course, as it relates to Purim, we'll talk about Purim. Um, so that's next week on Monday night at nine o'clock. 
And Wednesday, we will be on for Tanya, same time, same place. So I'm really, really, really looking forward. And Be'ezer Hashem, we will continue as close as possible to Pesach, probably until the week before Pesach. Um, and I know that many of you will be cleaning for Pesach or doing different stuff while we learn, but I feel like the next few chapters are the path out of Mitzrayim. So I'm not gonna stop, you know, just when we are working on getting out of Mitzrayim. I'm really, really excited to learn how to be that Benini, how to make those choices. Because now we know, um, we know that we, we talked a lot about, today we talked a lot about the importance of every single choice. So now we need tools. How do we actually make choices that are, in law, that are aligned with our bittel, aligned with our awareness of Hashem? How do we do that? That's what we're going to learn about in the next couple of chapters. And it's super exciting. So I'm looking forward.